Well, this morning is the first of a two-part message, uh, a Christmas message taken from Isaiah chapter 9, where we find the famous uh, phrase for uh, unto us a child is born. So we will be reading Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your zeal to save us and for the amazing way in which you did it. By sending your Son to come to earth, born uh, in Bethlehem, a baby, and then to grow up and live a sinless life, and give his life on our behalf, and then rise again from the dead. Thank you for the wonderful gift of our Lord and Savior. Now, Lord, we pray that you will help us to understand uh, what uh, Jesus did for us and what uh, his birth means to us uh, more deeply, more fully uh, than we ever have. And we pray that you will speak to us through this prophecy that the, that, uh, the prophet Isaiah gave. In Jesus' name, amen. So, the kind of the central statement of uh, this passage is uh, here, for to us a child is born. Uh, These words are on our Christmas cards, and very appropriately so. Uh, We sing these words in Christmas songs, Uh, especially comes to mind the song from Handel's Messiah, uh, where this is the main uh, content of the song. Uh, For to us a child is born, a son is given. Now, what do these words mean? And uh, you might think, well, I already know pastor is talking about Jesus. I guess I can go home now. (laughs) And uh, you're right, it is definitely talking about Jesus. But please don't go home now. um, Because we want to meditate on what these words mean using this passage in Isaiah. Now, when I say meditate, I'm not talking about some weird Eastern religion thing where we're kind of like, hmm, and we try to get our minds to be empty. Uh, some of us uh, are used to that condition, perhaps, but uh, <laughs> that's not what the, the, the point is. The point is um, biblical meditation is kind of the opposite of that. We are intentionally filling our minds with God's truth. So we're thinking uh, deeply and carefully about what this means to us and what this means for us together. And we're using this prophecy to do this. Now, this week we're going to be looking at the, the, the words in red here, uh, the first five verses. And this is mostly talking about uh, we will be seeing what this child does for us, uh, what he has accomplished on our behalf. And then, Lord willing, next week, Sunday morning, and I think it's wonderful that Christmas lands on a Sunday, and I can't think of anything better to do or any place better to be than uh, worshiping the Lord on Christmas morning. 
you know, you, you may not be aware of this, but in a lot of places around the world, no matter what day Christmas is on, they have church services on Christmas Day to celebrate uh, Jesus. And uh, so next Sunday, we will be here, and we'll be talking about the part in green, which mostly focuses on who Jesus is. And we will be thinking about that also using the prophecy which Isaiah has given. Now, these words that we are looking at in Isaiah, they're a prophecy which he gave about 730 years before Christ was born. Uh, so it's not wrong to say that these are Isaiah's words, and even the New Testament speaks of it this way, but these are also God's words spoken through Isaiah. And certainly Isaiah understood uh, some of the meaning of this, but the Bible makes it clear that the prophets did not fully understand all of the meaning of their own prophecies. And uh, because we have the New Testament, there are parts of this that we actually understand more fully and more completely than Isaiah did. Now, to understand these words, we need to uh, kind of go back to Isaiah's day. And it's talking about these places that, uh, the, uh, these strange sounding places, the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. Uh, it's talking about Galilee. And God was using what was going on in these places at this time, about 2,700 years ago. God was using what was going on then to provide a picture of what uh, Jesus uh, was going to do for all of us when he came. So to understand this picture, we need to think about the situation back then. And uh, where was Zebulun, and where was Naphtali, and where was Galilee, and what does this have to do with anything? Uh, so here's a map of Israel in Isaiah's day. Now I know you can't read the map uh, very well, um, except maybe Joy <laughs> um, in the front pew with her young eyes, but um, you can see there's different colors. And the different colors represent the land that was divided up and given to the 12 tribes of Israel. So each tribe had its own area uh, where they lived, their own land that was their land. And uh, up here is the land of Zebulun, which was one of the tribes, Naphtali, which was another one of the tribes, and Galilee was not a tribe. Galilee, uh, one of the things Galilee is, is the name of a lake. Now let's blow that up so we can see just that section. And there we go. Uh, so this is the northern section of Israel. And there's Zebulun. That's the territory where the people in Zebulun lived. And uh, there's Naphtali. Uh, where those people lived. Uh, Galilee is what we call the, the big lake there, the Sea of Galilee, but it was used to refer to that whole area. Uh, Naphtali, Zebulun, Issachar, that whole area would have been referred to as Galilee, uh, apparently back in Isaiah's day and then also during Jesus' day. And in fact, most of Jesus' ministry happened in the area uh, called Galilee. Uh, which is part of what this prophecy is about. Now, it says that the people were walking in darkness, and, and, and it describes this as a land of deep darkness. It talks about gloom and distress. And so we want to uh, think about this because the darkness of the people back then is a picture of darkness uh, that people today have when they're living in this world without Jesus. So to understand this picture, we need to know what was going on back then in Zebulun, in Naphtali, in the area of Galilee. And that will help us to understand this picture that God was giving us through Isaiah. And for us to understand salvation, we need to understand what it is we're being saved from and why we need to be saved. So we're going to think about this a little bit, beginning by talking about what was going on back then. And the first thing that was going on at the time that Isaiah wrote these words, there was a civil war. Now, long before Isaiah, uh, Israel had split into two. 
And there was the southern kingdom, which is mostly that purple part at the bottom, and a little bit more, but mostly that purple part at the bottom. And all the rest of those colors uh, were the uh, northern kingdom. The southern kingdom in the Bible is often called Judah, and the northern part is called Israel, although sometimes the whole thing we call Israel. And so they were fighting each other, which is something that should never have happened. These were all people descended from those who God had rescued out of Egypt. They were all supposed to be worshiping the same God, loving one another, uh, being on the same side, and instead they were involved in a civil war. And as is often the case, this civil war was bloody and it was terrible. And many of the worst conflicts in history have been civil wars. The bloodiest war in American history, the war where they estimate that the most people died, uh, surprisingly, it's not World War II, even though that was a, a much, much larger war around the world, but it's still, to this day, the Civil War, uh, when the most Americans were killed. Today, if you look around the world and you think, what is the most terrible war going on right now? Probably, it's the Civil War in Syria. Uh, and if you see the TV, you see just the terrible uh, suffering of people and families and men and women and children in that civil war. Well, they had a civil war going on between people who should never have been fighting, but they were fighting each other. Now, in this civil war, both sides were bad at this time. Uh, the southern kingdom had a bad king who was not following God, and the northern kingdom had a bad king who was not following God. At, the time, at this particular time when Isaiah was writing, Still, if you're wondering what side was, was, was right, I don't think there really was a right side, but the Bible seems to indicate that the northern kingdom was more wrong. Uh, and, um, and so if you were living in Naphtali in the area of Galilee, you were in an area of civil war, and you were on the side that was wrong. So you're in a bad situation, but that's not the worst thing that was going on that's not the biggest problem they were facing. It's a terrible problem, but something a lot worse was on the way and it was already uh, coming close to them. Uh, much bigger problems were on the way, and to appreciate the much bigger problem, we have to look at another map from back in this same time period. Now this is, so before we were looking just at Israel. Now we're looking at the whole area that today we call the Middle East, and that purple blob up there, that's, that's Assyria. That's how big Assyria was when they got started. And then that green blob is the Assyrians. They, they got a lot of armies, and they started attacking everybody all over the place, and they were winning everywhere they went. So the green blob is where Assyria spread out to. So they spread out to be a really big kingdom. And that little brown dot down there, that is the southern kingdom, which is the part of Israel that was left after Syria advances. So Syria is eventually going to wipe out and totally defeat the northern kingdom. Now the northern kingdom had not been totally defeated yet at the time of Isaiah, but it was already coming close. And in fact, uh, during the time of the king who was alive then, they were already, Assyria was already beginning to attack some of their cities, some of their towns, and take some of their people captive. We read about this in 2 Kings, in the time of Pekah, king of Israel. Now, if we had time, I could show you, compare what Isaiah wrote in chapters 7 and 8 and 9 to Chronicles and Kings, and we could figure out that Pekah was probably the king who was alive when Isaiah wrote his famous words in Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is given. Uh, so Pekah was king in Israel, in the northern kingdom. In the time of Pekah, king of Israel, tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, that's the guy with the big purple blob that stretched out to the big green blob. Uh, in the time of Pekah, king of Israel, tiglath Pileser, uh, king of Assyria, came and took Ejon, Abel, Beth, Maaka, Janoa, Kadesh, and Hazor. He took Gilead and Galilee including all the land of Naphtali, and deported 
the people to Assyria. So this probably happened shortly after Isaiah gave that prophecy, but it was already on the way. And now later, uh, Babylon comes and defeats the southern kingdom and takes them prisoner. And when Babylon took the people prisoner and captive, it, nobody wants to be captive uh, and exported to, an, to another land. But Babylon actually treated many of the captives pretty decently. And many of them were able to stay together, keep their identity, and eventually, 70 years later, come back. But that was not true with Assyria. Assyria was cruel, ugly, harsh. They, they, lit, they put hooks. In the, the people, they took them over. Now they're going to take them away. They would put hooks in their noses and, and, and have them march like they were cattle uh, to the new land of captivity. And the truth is, for the most part, we don't know what happened to these people. Uh, they kind of disappeared from history, probably not totally, not completely, uh, but it was a harsh defeat that they experienced. And this was already on the way. The warning signs were already there uh, during this time, a time of gloom, a kind, time of despair, a time of darkness. Now, the civil war in the impending invasion of Assyria were symptoms of a deeper inner problem. So what I'm saying is that as terrible as the civil war was, and as terrible as Assyria on the way to defeating them was, that was not their biggest problem. They had a problem that was worse, and in fact, uh, these things were symptoms of this deeper problem, and the Bible tells us exactly what their biggest problem was. Here it is in 2 Kings 17, beginning in verse 7. All this took place. This is talking about when Assyria finally defeats them and wipes them out, uh, shortly after Isaiah's prophecy, and he warned them that this was going to happen, uh, but they still didn't repent. Um, all this took place because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before them, as well as the practices that the kings of Israel had introduced. So there were other countries around them that didn't know God, that did all kind of evil things. And the Israelites started copying the evil things that their neighbors were doing. And in addition to that, the kings of Israel made up some new evil things to do. And so they were not obeying God. They were not doing what God wanted them to do. It says in verse 9, the Israelites secretly did things against the Lord their God that were not right. Now here's the thing about secret sin. It might be a secret from your neighbors. Uh, you might even keep it a secret from your own family. Usually they eventually find out. Most of the time it goes that way. Uh, but you might succeed in keeping it from your family. But ultimately, no sin is really secret. Because the one who matters most sees it all. He sees everything we do, everything we think, everything we want, every place we go, everything we say. It wasn't secret from God. And they didn't take that into account. And now they're paying the price. Their deepest problem, the cause of all their other problems, was their sin. So... Their darkness is a picture and an example of the type of darkness people without Jesus live in today. So I want to think about, because none of us, are, um, we're not in a civil war, and we're not uh, in danger of being invaded by Assyria, although the, uh, our nation th that we live in has some of our sons and daughters in the, in the middle of the civil war uh, in, in Syria even today, in the same location where, where these things were happening back then. But uh, nevertheless, that's not uh, the, the way it applies to us. I want to think about how this applies to all of us and to all people without Jesus. And so I want to think about our darkness. Uh, this was a picture of their darkness and gloom. What is our darkness like? And uh, civil war, 
um, we have relationships which should be filled with peace and joy and love. Uh, relationships uh, with family members, parents and children, uh, brothers and sisters, even husbands and wives. And sometimes uh, in the world today, uh, when people aren't following Jesus, and at least one side isn't following Jesus when this happens, these relationships that should be places of comfort and peace become places full of pain and conflict and hurt. And our, our relationships are broken, and we are experiencing uh, civil war. And then there's kind of the equivalent of our Assyria. Assyria was an evil that came from outside. And there's all kind of problems which threaten to enslave or destroy us. Things like sickness, uh, addictions, financial problems, evil people. Uh, the devil hates everybody, and uh, he's always looking for ways to steal from us, to deceive us, and to kill us. And he has lots of tools and enemies that he uses to attack us. These things are also judgments uh, from God when people are not walking with him and are not following Jesus. All these problems come. And so we see that uh, our lives, in some ways, uh, when we're walking without Jesus, mirror the situation that was going on in Galilee 2,700 years ago. Like them, our deepest problem is our sin. Uh, all our other problems uh, are temporary uh, surface problems, but our biggest problem, and the one that will eventually be uh, cause our, lead to our eternal destruction if it's not dealt with, is our sin and the fact that we have uh, we we commit specific acts of sin, and then in addition to that, uh, we have all these wrong desires. We are bent towards sinning until Jesus fixes us, and uh, we have this sin nature, which I represent here with a blackened heart. And, um, but thankfully, that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. Isaiah goes on to say, a great light is coming. From his perspective, a light has dawned. He's speaking prophetically, looking ahead to when Jesus comes. And, uh, and this light is none other than Jesus Christ coming into the world to rescue us from the darkness. So let's think about how Jesus helps us uh, when he comes uh, and, 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 and when a person finds Jesus and experiences Jesus. And this great light begins to shine into our life. And it begins with him dealing with the deepest problem that we have, our sin. Jesus was speaking to a woman who was sinful, and everybody knew she was sinful. Uh, but, she, but she trusted in Jesus. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And this is what he says through his spirit to every human heart that hears the good news about Jesus, how he came to earth, how he lived a perfect life, how he died for our sins, how he rose again. And when that person wants to be saved by Jesus and accepts Jesus as Savior and Lord, then Jesus forgives all our sins. That's just the beginning. God promised for those who would accept his new covenant in Jesus that he said, I will give you a new heart. Now, this doesn't mean that all of our wrong feelings and thoughts are instantly gone. Uh, you all know that. But it does mean that in the deepest part of us, after we're born again, uh, the Holy Spirit is living in us and there is a deep part of every Christian that our deepest desire is to please our Heavenly Father and to walk with God and to be in His presence. And so, yes, we still struggle uh, in our emotions, in our minds, with some wrong feelings and thoughts and habits, but now our heart has been changed. He gives us a new heart. Uh, now, there's other problems that we're still facing, and for that, He gives us grace and peace. All through the New Testament, over and over again, we find these two paired together. Uh, here's an example. In Philippians, uh, Paul writes, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and 
the Lord Jesus Christ. When we find Jesus, we start to experience his grace and his peace, which is exactly what we need for these other types of darkness in our life. God's grace helps us with all of these enemies that are attacking us. Now, God's grace uh, is expressed in different ways. Sometimes the way that God's grace is shown, and boy, I really like it when this one happens, is uh, God just lifts us up out of the problem, or God just chases our problem away, he fixes the problem, it's gone. That's wonderful. Uh, Other times, God's grace is given by giving us strength and courage and, 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 and perseverance to face a difficult problem, and with the strength he gives us, we're able to overcome the problem. So he doesn't just take it away from us. We have to struggle, but we're struggling with his help, with his strength, with his grace. And then sometimes there are some problems that, uh, and, and the Apostle Paul experienced this, and I think all of us experience this at some level, there are some problems which stay. And, and they're going to stay until uh, the Lord calls us home. Our whole life here on earth, um, but God gives us grace to go through that and to make it through and to keep having hope and to keep having faith and to not give up. And God actually uses those painful problems for his good purposes in our life. And in the end, it turns out all for good. He gives us grace to deal with all of these enemies that attack us. And then God gives us peace. Now, when we start to get filled with the Holy Spirit and we have fruit of the Holy Spirit and we're loving and kind and good and faithful and and peaceful and full of joy, more of our relationships are going to be peaceful, especially with uh, other believers. Um, And the Bible says that we should live at peace with all men as far as it's up to us. And so it's true that as long as we're in this world, uh, even when we're doing things right, and we don't always do things completely right, but even when we do, sometimes there's going to be conflict with other people, and it's just unavoidable. Um, But even then, we have a peace that goes, it's, it's, it's beyond understanding, the Bible says. It's a deep peace that does not depend on our circumstances. It does not depend on what other people do. We know that we're okay with God, and that's what matters most. Uh, But it is manifest in, uh, in general, a lot more peacefulness in many of our relationships. So God comes, and he does all this for us. A light, a great light has come, and has chased away our darkness. Now, how should we feel about this? Well, Isaiah writes about how we should feel about this. And he says, he's speaking to God. He says, you have enlarged the nation. And uh, that reminds me of how the gospel is spreading all over the world. He says, you have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. So you've been in a long, hard battle, or you've been working all year on the harvest. Uh, You get the harvest in, or the war is over, uh, and you've won, and the enemy's defeated, and now you have peace. And it's a time of celebration. Isaiah continues to describe this. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, what's that about? That's remembering, remember Gideon, that story how with just 300 men, he defeated this huge army. That was the army of Midian that he defeated. So this is a reference uh, to that. He says, for as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. Thinking about sin as a, as a yoke, and before we're saved, uh, very few people are consciously, intentionally uh, serving the devil, like devil worshipers. That thing, that, that exists, but even though they don't know it, the Bible teaches that everybody who's not serving Jesus, even though they don't know it, they are serving the devil. And the thing is that Jesus says his yoke is easy, his burden is light, He loves us. The things he gives us to do are all for our own good, eventually. And um, and, and, and he cares about us. But the devil is not like that at all. He is a cruel taskmaster. And when we have that yoke of sin on us, it's just making our life miserable. And Isaiah is saying, praise God, you shattered that yoke. And uh, 
the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor uh, that the enemy used to beat us has all been taken away. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. I read two different ideals about what this could mean. They're very similar ideals. I think either one of them or both could be true. Uh, it could be referring to uh, the fact that we have defeated the enemy and now we're burning up all of their uh, boots and uh, all of their stuff that we defeated them with. Or it could just be a symbol that we don't need warrior boots and, uh, and, 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 and uh, uh, we don't need uh, military garment anymore because the time of peace has come. Uh, the same idea as beating the swords into plowshares. But either way, it's a time of celebration. Peace has come. The great light has driven the darkness out of our lives. It's a time of celebration. Maybe if Isaiah was writing today and he wanted to give a similar ideal of the type of joy we feel when we accept Jesus and we understand what he's done for us and he sets us free from all that darkness, maybe he would use an example from after World War II like this. He, maybe he would, and this is similar to what he was saying. He's saying, it's like a tickle tape parade. The war is over, peace has come, it's victory in Jesus. He set you free from the darkness. The light has come into your life. And this is how we should feel as we think about the fact that to us a child is born. And I hope that as you, we get to the end of this message that uh, you feel a little bit more deeply how good and wonderful it is, what, what a difference it's made in our lives that God sent Jesus, that he was born in Bethlehem and became our Lord and Savior and died for our sins. For to us, a child is born. Next week, we'll continue to think on this theme. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Christmas Lord, we're thankful for family, and we're thankful for fellowship. We're thankful for uh, holidays and a break uh, when we get breaks from work or school. Uh, we're even thankful for presents. But all of that pales. It's tiny compared to how much we are thankful for Jesus coming and driving the darkness out of our lives. We were hopeless. We were in despair. We deserved destruction, and we were on the way to being destroyed without Jesus. And Jesus came, and not because we deserved it, but because of your great love, he changes everything for us. Thank you, Heavenly Father, so much. Help us to remember and feel that, and help us to sh shine the light of Jesus so that others who haven't experienced this freedom yet soon will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.